In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome back to our series of talks on the Catholic faith offered by Servants of the Holy Family. I am Father Simons, and this is talk number eight. <clears throat> this evening we will be doing lessons 15 and 16 out of the Baltimore Catechism number three by Father Connell. So this is about the two great commandments and then the first commandment Third, first of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Question 188. Besides believing what God has revealed, what else must we do to be saved? Besides believing what God has revealed, we must keep His law. Okay, so... The Ten Commandments which God gave us are, it was not necessary to reveal these commandments because everything that is in the Ten Commandments is reasonable. It's in our nature. <clears throat> it's supposed, so to speak, in our genes. Because we can reason to all of these commandments, everything that God tells us. He gave us these Ten Commandments as an assistance to help us see the truth more easily and to recognize it and to follow it. This is the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Nothing new as far as our nature is concerned. So he says in sacred scripture, if you love me, keep my commandments. Which are the two great commandments that contain the whole law of God? This is question 189. The two great commandments that contain the whole law of God are, first, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind and with thy whole strength. Second, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And we add, for the love of God. This is why we do anything. We always do everything for the love of God. And so you love your neighbor as yourself for the love of God. If anybody's looking for the true faith and their heart is in the right place, they will find it in the Catholic Church. And if they are looking for the true faith, God will lead them to the Catholic faith. You can't find in any other religion the love that is taught by the Catholic faith, Catholic Church. And this is the only God that ever existed who existed for love. And this is what he asks of us. This is all he asks. And if we do it, that's all that's necessary, is to love him with our whole heart, whole soul, etc. This is everything, all of creation, the whole universe, the Catholic faith, everything in this world is based on love. And if we love God, then we will do what love demands, and we will keep the commandments. Even if we didn't know what they were, we would keep them. This is what love does for us. And this is why we have these commandments, so that we can love God. <clears throat> so we have further scripture. This is from St. John. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And from St. Matthew, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So in order to reach heaven, we keep the commandments, and that includes perfect love of God and of neighbor. The first three commandments are love of God, this is what they aim towards, 
and the last seven of the Ten Commandments aim at love of our neighbor. <clears throat> so who is included in love of our neighbor? Everyone except those who are in hell. We don't love the devils and we don't love anyone who is damned. Everyone else we love and we pray for them. So we pray for our enemies, our worst enemies. We are commanded, we are told by Christ to pray for them. Love your enemies as yourself. Next, 190. What must we do to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves? To love God, our neighbor, and ourselves, we must keep the commandments of God and of the church and perform the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. What is mercy? We have these works of mercy. What are they? The works of mercy <clears throat> are based on the natural law. And what is the natural law that they are based on? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Unto you. That's what they're based on. But what is mercy? Mercy is virtue which shows compassion for another's misfortune. So this is the difference between just simply practicing kindness towards everyone and an act of mercy. <coughs> when we practice kindness, we are not necessarily uh, treating someone, someone with compassion because of his misfortune. But that's what mercy does. Anytime we help someone, anytime we feel for someone because of his misfortune, this is an act of mercy, and we feel it because mercy is a part of love, and especially love as it relates to, believe it or not, justice. This is mercy. So, this is how we prove our love for our neighbors by, act, by practicing these works of mercy. So we have some scripture. <clears throat> Give alms, this is from the book of Tobias. Give alms out of thy substance, and turn not away thy face from any poor person. For so it shall come to pass, that the face of the Lord shall not be turned from thee. Practice compassion towards our neighbor, and then we receive the same from God. Let love be without pretense, this is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Hate what is evil, hold to what is good, love one another with fraternal charity, anticipating one another with honor. Be not slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Be patient in tribulation, persevering in prayer, Share the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of one mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, <clears throat> but con condescend to the lowly. Be not wise in your own conceits. To no man render evil for evil, but provide good things not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as far as in you lies, be at peace with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. 
from Galatians. Brethren, even if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. And from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, And we exhort you, brethren, reprove the irregular, comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient towards all men. See that no one renders evil for evil to any man, but always strive after good towards one another and towards all men. We have this impression that these works of mercy come from the church. Couldn't be any farther from the truth. They come right from the mouth of Christ himself. <clears throat> this is from our Lord and Savior. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, take possession of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you covered me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Works of mercy from the mouth of Christ. Then the just will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and take thee in, or naked and clothe thee? Or when did we see thee sick or in prison and come to thee? And answering, the king will say to them, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did it for one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me to eat, and so on. As long as you did not do it for one of these least ones, you did not do it for me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the just into everlasting life. Thus far, faith is all that we need. These are good works. And if you don't practice these good works, you go into everlasting punishment. If you do practice them, eternal reward for good works. So there you have it. These <clears throat> are the question 191, which are the chief corporal works of mercy? Seven corporal, seven spiritual. The chief corporal works of mercy are seven. To feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit the imprisoned, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, to bury the dead. And if you deliberately refuse to perform these, that's what Christ was warning us about. These are, all of these works of mercy are necessary for us if we are able to practice them, both the corporal and the spiritual. Of course, sometimes we cannot practice them for many reasons, but they are necessary at least that we practice them when we are able to. And by the way, the, it is not necessary to practice these works of mercy purely without any reward in this life. As long as we do them for love of God, we will receive our rewards. So, for instance, a doctor, even though he's being paid for his work, if he does it for love of God, that's a work of mercy. Any compassion that you show to others in their need is a work of mercy as if you do it for love of God. Very important. <clears throat> A 
which are the chief spiritual works of mercy. The chief spiritual works of mercy are seven. To admonish the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive all injuries, to pray for the living and the dead. Now, it is not always possible for everyone to admonish the sinner. We're only, strictly speaking, obliged to admonish the sinner if we think that he will listen to us. We're not bound to go around admonishing all sinners. And the same is true of instructing the ignorant. And once again, instructing the ignorant includes even something secular if we do it for love of God. It includes this because this is someone who needs compassion. He is ignorant. When we instruct him for love of God, we receive a reward. Beautiful. Same with counseling the doubtful. If we're not able to do it, that's our life. And including comforting the sorrowful. But the last three of these, everyone is able to do. To bear wrongs patiently. To forgive all injuries. We are all bound to do that. Who does it? Who forgives all injuries? To pray for the living and the dead. Who is not able to do that? So you can see that even if we can't practice all of the works of mercy all the time, those three we can practice practically all the time. <clears throat> Obviously the spiritual works of mercy excel the others. They are more important because they are directly spiritual. But nevertheless, the corporal works of mercy are meritorious. And even if we do not practice, practice these works of mercy directly, we can practice them indirectly, let us say, by helping financially, or if we are part of the government, by helping those who are in need for love of God. Even a government official can gain merit for what he does by helping those in need. And he's being paid to do it. It's a beautiful thing. Those who teach in colleges, in, in any school, if they teach for love of God, those who are in need of instruction, they gain merit, gain a reward, eternal reward. <clears throat> of course, one of the reasons that we practice these things, these works of mercy and all the good that we do to others, Love of God, yes, number one. But secondarily, in imitation of Christ, good reason to practice the works of mercy and any acts of kindness, just to imitate Christ. 193. Is everyone obliged to perform the works of mercy? Everyone is obliged to perform the works of mercy according to his own ability and the need of his neighbor. 194. Are all the ordinary deeds done every day to relieve the corporal or spiritual needs of others true works of mercy? All the ordinary deeds done every day to relieve the corporal or spiritual needs of others are true works of mercy if done in the name of Christ. <coughs> One ninety-five. Which are the commandments of God? The commandments of God are these ten. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember thou keep holy the Lord's day. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. One ninety six. Should we be satisfied merely to keep the commandments of God? We should not be satisfied merely to keep the commandments of God, but should always be ready to do good deeds even when they are not commanded. So you see that the commandments of God are the minimum requirements. Obviously, love demands that we go much farther than merely keeping the commandments. They should be kept not merely according to the letter, but according to the spirit, which obliges us to strive for greater perfection. 197. What does our Savior especially recommend that is not strictly commanded by the law of God? Our Savior, Savior especially recommends the observance of the evangelical counsels, voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and perfect obedience. <clears throat> so, to return to this idea that all of creation was for love. God d asks, he pleads with us. This is true throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It's all about love. This is why God made us. He made us to bring us to heaven. But in this life, we reach heaven by number one, love of God. Everything else falls into place if we love God and we love our neighbor. Now, everything was for love, number one. So this is why we are counseled in the Bible, especially in the Gospels, to keep voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and perfect obedience. Because these are the most certain way of reaching heaven, of loving God and saving our souls. So the first thing we want to do is we want to reach heaven. And in order to do that, most certainly, we need to practice chastity, poverty, and obedience, because these three virtues, we can say, practices, remove us from the world, and by these we give ourselves to God. This is the most perfect way of practicing love of God and dedication to Him, because then we can give ourselves, we can love Him perfectly. Number one. Number two, not only can we reach heaven, but we can sanctify ourselves so we can give ourselves to God with perfect love most easily by practicing these three counsels. And thirdly, it is the most perfect way of helping others to save their souls. This is what religious do. Not only do they practice, first of all, trying to reach heaven by perfect love of God, but they help others to reach heaven by practicing these three counsels. And so this is the religious life, but especially is this the priesthood, practicing love of God and imitation of Christ. This is what the priesthood is all about is perfect imitation of Christ, especially in the offering of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, because the priest actually takes the place of Christ when he says the words of consecration. And he says, this is my body. It is Christ and the priest 
who are consecrating the bread and making, turning it into the body of Christ, the body and blood of Christ. And also, does he imitate Christ perfectly and he takes Christ's place in the sacrament of penance. He says, just as Christ told us to do, he says, I forgive thee, because Christ said when he rose from the dead, whose sins you shall forgive, speaking to his priests, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. So the priest says in Latin, I forgive you. And by those very words, Christ himself is forgiving them. So he takes the place of Christ perfectly. And this is the sacramental grace of the priesthood. He is practicing perfection and love of God and in a most perfect manner. This is what the, the grace of the priesthood is. Sanctity. Imitation of Christ in the most perfect way. <clears throat> Next chapter. Chapter 16. The first commandment of God. 198. What is the first commandment of God? The first commandment of God is... I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. 199. What are we commanded by the first commandment? By the first commandment, we are commanded to offer to God alone the supreme worship that is due him. <clears throat> and so we have the scripture. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou worship, and him only shalt thou serve. That's from St. Luke. And from Romans, For from him and through him and unto him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. 200. How do we worship God? We worship God by acts of faith, hope, and charity and by adoring him and praying to him. <clears throat> and we cannot pass over these further instructions under this question. We worship God by an act of faith when we firmly assent to the truth of God's revelation on the word of God revealing, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. So remember, an act of faith is that you believe God himself and what he has revealed in the sacred scripture and in sacred tradition. You believe God himself. We worship God by an act of hope when we firmly trust that God who is all powerful and faithful to his promises will in his mercy give us eternal happiness and the means to obtain it. We worship God by an act of charity when we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. We adore God by acknowledging his infinite excellence, our complete dependence upon him and our total subjection to his will. We pray to God and this is the very definition of prayer, by lifting up our minds and, and hearts to him. Acts of faith, hope, and charity, adoration, and prayer may be internal or external. They are internal when they are only in our mind or heart. They are external when they are manifested outwardly by signs and words. <clears throat> external worship is of no value unless it is joined with internal worship and is an outward manifestation of our internal convictions and sentiments. Thus the importance of paying attention when we say our prayers. Externally. <clears throat>
external worship is necessary because we are bound to render to God the homage of our bodies and because it serves to preserve, increase, and express internal worship. This is the answer to those who say that they don't believe in organized religion. Of course, we know this is an excuse, but nevertheless, this is, in addition to all of the other things that we can say to these people who are hypocrites, we can say this, that it is necessary to worship God with our body. And of course, those who are not part of organized religion do not worship God in any way. This is just an excuse for them. But it is necessary for us to, to have external worship because not only in our mind and in our will, our heart, do we need to acknowledge God and to speak with Him, to speak to Him, to acknowledge His our dependence upon him, but we need to express it with our body because he made our body too. Everything must acknowledge God, everyone, everything. Man is composed of body and soul, and the body can and does aid the soul in its operations. We are moved to be more devout in our internal acts of worship by sacred music, art, public and private recitation of prayers, and the ceremonies of the liturgy. <clears throat> 201. What does faith oblige us to do? Faith obliges us, first, to make efforts to find out what God has revealed, second, to believe firmly what God has revealed, Third, to profess our faith openly whenever necessary. God, whose power and knowledge are infinite, can reveal supernatural truths to man. Every man who knows or suspects, that's what everyone does, occasionally at least, suspects that he does not profess the religion revealed by God is under the obligation of seeking it and when he has found it, of embracing it. Whoever has attained the use of reason must make an internal act of faith. First, we know that we have spoken about this in the past, but it's good to reveal, to repeat it. First, when he comes to the knowledge of divine revelation or becomes certain of a dogma of the church. Second, when he, having rejected the errors of infidelity or heresy, recognizes the obligation of believing the Catholic religion. Third, when an act of faith is necessary to resist temptations against faith or another virtue. Fourth, often during life. We are obliged to make acts of faith often because we know for certain that there is a God. Even without faith, we know that. Our mind tells us if we are honest. That is the reason why atheists will not be saved because they are not being honest. It is not because they are stupid. Many atheists are very intelligent. They will not be damned for their lack of intelligence. It is because of their dishonesty. That's the reason they will be lost. A Catholic is bound to profess his faith openly. First, whenever the honor due to God requires it. For example, when his faith to when his failure, excuse me, to profess his faith openly would be equivalent to a denial of faith. Second, when the good of his neighbor requires it. We have some scripture. 
Therefore, everyone who acknowledge, acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I, in turn, will disown him before my Father in heaven. That's from St. Matthew. And from St. Luke. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and of the holy angels. Two o two. What does faith oblige us to do? Excuse me. What does hope oblige us to do? <clears throat> hope obliges us to trust firmly that God will give us eternal life and the means to obtain it. An act of hope must be made. First, when a person comes to a knowledge of God's existence and his own destiny, namely, eternal happiness in heaven. Second, when it is necessary to resist temptations against the virtue of hope or some other virtue. Third, after the virtue of hope is lost by a sin opposed to it, because if we sin against hope or faith, then we lose in a serious way. Then we lose those virtues. Very frightening. That is, by despair or presumption. Those are the two sins that are committed against hope. Very frightening. Because when we commit any serious sin, we always lose love. We become God's enemy. We lose sanctifying grace. And we are deserving of eternal punishment. But we are able to gain back God's love because of our faith and hope. Because we still believe and we still hope, we still want to be saved. But if you commit a sin against faith or hope, then what do you do? Because these virtues, which we depended on for the loss of sanctifying grace in all of our other sins, apart from the sins against these two virtues, faith and hope, we always had faith and hope to bring us back. To God. We commit a sin against faith or hope, then we have nothing to depend on, nothing to fall back on. What will bring us back to God? We have nothing. We'll take a great miracle, so to speak, of grace to give us back these virtues. Fourth thing that we must we are demanded, is demanded of us, is an act of hope often during life, just like the virtue of faith, practice of faith. 203. We have this beautiful scripture here following this question of hope, the virtue of hope. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, in accordance with the faith of God's elect, and the full knowledge of the truth, which is according to piety, in the hope of everlasting, of life everlasting, which God, who does not lie, promised before the ages began. Implies when he created the angels. Before the ages began, he promised life everlasting. So he created the angels first. 203. What does charity oblige us to do? Charity obliges us to love God above all things because he is infinitely good and to love our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. An act of charity must be made. First, 
when a person comes to the realization of the duty of loving God above all things and his neighbor as himself for the love of God. Second, when temptation can be overcome only by an act of charity. Third, at the hour of death. Interesting. We should make an act of love of God when we are dying. It's essential. Fourth, often during life. 204. How can a Catholic best safeguard his faith? A Catholic can best safeguard his faith by making frequent acts of faith, by praying for a strong faith, by studying his religion very earnestly, by living a good life, by good reading, by refusing to associate with the enemies of the church, and by not reading books and papers opposed to the church and her teaching. How does a Catholic sin against faith? A Catholic sins against faith by apostasy, heresy, indifferentism, and by taking part in non-Catholic worship. Four ways. <clears throat> and we should define these. Apostasy is the complete abandon abandonment of the Christian faith by those who have been baptized. That's apostasy. Complete abandonment of the Christian faith by those who have been baptized. Heresy is the refusal of baptized persons retaining the name Christian to accept one or more of the truths revealed by God and taught by the Catholic Church. If this refusal is voluntary and obstinate, it is formal heresy. If it is involuntary, involuntary, it is material heresy. Because sometimes people em embrace an error unknowingly, not, so to speak, voluntarily, in goodwill. Indifferentism is the error of those who hold that one religion is as good as another and that all religions are equally true and pleasing to God or that one is free to accept or reject any or all religions. Now obviously this indifferentism is completely contrary to reason and that's why it is difficult to believe that these people are in good faith because it is so contrary to reason that one religion is as good as another. Anyone who has any ability to think should be able to see that this is ridiculous or that we do not need to embrace any religions. He can reject all religions, completely contrary to reason. Those take part in the worship of non-Catholics who join in their religious services. Attendance at non-Catholic religious services, provided no part is taken in such worship, is allowed for a sufficiently grave reason. For example, presence at a non-Catholic funeral or a marriage ceremony for social reasons. Infidelity is also a sin against faith. This is infidelity. It is the unbelief of those to whom the truths of faith have been sufficiently proposed but who nevertheless deliberately refuse to accept them. We have a little scripture regarding heresy. 
<clears throat> this is from the Acts of the Apostles. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will get in among you and will not spare the flock. And from among your own selves, men will rise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Question 206. Why does a Catholic sin against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship? A Catholic sins against faith, against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship because he thus professes belief in a religion he knows is false. 207. What are the sins against hope? The sins against hope are presumption and despair. <clears throat> 208. When does a person sin by presumption? A person sins by presumption when he trusts that he can be saved by his own efforts without God's help or by God's help without his own efforts. How many people are guilty of that sin? That think they can be saved by God's help without their own efforts. I've been saved. Right? Two oh nine. When does a person sin by despair? A person sins by despair when he deliberately refuses to trust that God will give him the necessary help to save his soul. Question 210. What are the chief sins against charity? The chief sins against charity are hatred of God and of our neighbor, envy, sloth, and scandal. Isn't that interesting? Sloth, laziness, is a sin against charity. When a person hates another, he wishes him evil or rejoices in his misfortune. And how many Catholics are guilty of that? Wishing, wishing misfortune on another or wishing him evil. One who hates God wishes evil to befall him to God, if that were possible, or wishes grievous sins to be committed, or rejoices in sin as an insult to God, Hatred of God is the most grievous offense against him and is always a mortal sin. A person who hates his neighbor wishes him harm or rejoices when evil befalls him. To wish a neighbor serious harm is a mortal sin. For example, to wish another's damnation. To wish a neighbor a slight evil or to hold a slight aversion for him is a venial sin. It is not a sin to wish some temporal misfortune to overtake another in order that he may be converted or cease to do harm. Nor is it sinful to wish another's death under the condition that it be in accord with God's will. For example, to wish a person's death so that he will be relieved of great suffering or because he is a menace to society or is likely to inflict grave harm on an innocent person because, or because he deserves death by reason of crime. Envy is sadness 
at another's good fortune, which is considered to be detracting from one's own excellence. Sadness at another's prosperity is not envy when it is caused by a neighbor's using his advantage to harm us, or when another is unreasonably and unjustly preferred to us. Sloth is distaste for spiritual things because their attainment requires much labor. Scandal is any word, act, or omission that is in itself evil or has the appearance of evil and which can be the occasion of another's sin. Scandal may be given even though no sin follows. A person who has already determined to sin or a person who cannot be led into sin cannot be scandalized. Scandal is direct when a word, act, or omission is intended to lead another to sin. Scandal is indirect when it is foreseen that one's word, act, or omission is likely to be the occasion of another's sin, even though such is not intended. Besides the sins against faith, this is question 211, besides the sins against faith, hope, and charity, what other sins does the first commandment forbid? Besides the sins against faith, hope, and charity, the first commandment forbids also superstition and sacrilege. 212. When does a person sin by superstition? A person sins by superstition when he attributes to a creature a power that belongs to God alone, as when he makes use of charms or spells, believes in dreams or fortune-telling, or go goes to spiritists. Superstition is by its nature a mortal sin, but it may be venial, either when the matter is slight or when there is a lack of full consent to the act. Often this sin is not mortal when there is question of certain popular superstitions, for example, belief in unlucky days or numbers, or when superstitious acts are performed as a joke without any serious thought of it attributing divine powers to a creature or when these acts are performed for amusement. Knock on wood. That is usually done out of amusement. 213. When does a person sin by sacrilege? A person sins by sacrilege when he mistreats sacred persons, places, or things. Lastly, brethren, <clears throat> what is mentioned in this chapter, well, one of the things that is just mentioned is that people often think that it is sufficient to simply lead a good life and we can be saved. Many people make this mistake. And we repeat, what the saints have told us is that faith is necessary. Without faith, that's scriptural, without faith we cannot be saved. So an act, acts of faith are necessary. It's not sufficient to be kind to our neighbor. And the saints believed, big saints, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Alphonsus, two examples, believed that all men would be judged by the cross, by the knowledge of the cross and by the knowledge of the Blessed Trinity. This is what they believed. So in other words, all men will be judged by whether or not they believe in these things and the question, of course, is how can most people believe 
in the truths of, of the Catholic faith, the most important ones, of course, we're talking about right now, the truths of the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation, that Christ, the Son of God, became a man and died on a cross to save us. And the answer is that we believe, these saints believed, that these truths will be revealed to all men before they die. And they will be given the grace to accept, to embrace these truths. And they will be judged by whether or not they accept this grace that is offered to them by Blessed Mother, Christ, the Blessed Trinity. They were given knowledge of these truths of the faith, the most important truths, maybe more, but certainly these. And of course, the most necessary truths that God exists and that he rewards the good and punishes the evil. And all men will be judged by these things. This is what we believe. This is not a dogma, but this is what these great saints believed, that all men will know the, tr the most important truths, at least, of the Catholic faith before they die. And they will be judged by their acceptance or denial of these truths. And that is all we have to say to you tonight. That's the end of these two chapters. And so we will say our prayer now. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.